I'm Nick Zeppos, Chancellor of Vanderbilt University. Welcome to the Zeppos Report, a podcast where I talk with people shaping and helping us understand our world. My guest today is a distinguished leader, philanthropist, and a trailblazer in America, Carly Fiorina. Carly was the CEO of Hewlett Packard from 1999 to 2005, becoming the very first woman to lead a Fortune 50 company. She was also the sole female candidate in a field of 17 Republicans vying for the 2016 presidential nomination. She is visiting campus today to engage the Vanderbilt community in a discussion entitled Redefining Leadership, Crafting Civic Virtues in America. Carly, welcome to the Zeppos Report. Thank you so much for having me. It's great for you to be here. So let's just start with a very simple question. Um, It can go in a lot of different directions, but it's one that I'm struggling with, with, you know, talking to my students, my faculty, my staff. What does it mean to be a good citizen in America to you? Mm. Well, first, I think as citizens, we should realize that we have the privilege of sovereignty. And what I mean by that is this is the only country, I think in history, certainly on the planet today, where sovereignty rests with the citizen, not with the government, not with the president, not with the king, with the citizens. And it's also the only country on earth that was founded on the principle that none of us are defined by our circumstances or where we come from or what our last name is or what our parents did or how we start. Those two things, the fact that we're not defined by our past or our parentage or our circumstances, the fact that we are sovereign is a huge privilege and it's a huge responsibility. You know, there's that old saying, you know, you get the politics you deserve, you get the government you deserve. Um, I think sometimes that as citizens, as sovereign citizens, we expect too much of political leaders who are far away somewhere. Mm -hmm. And we fail to realize how much difference each of us can make in our own families, in our own communities, in our own institutions. And so I think to be a citizen means to be a leader, and leaders solve problems and unlock potential in other people and circumstances. They don't have to have big titles or positions, but they do have to realize they can make a difference and solve problems. And I think as citizens, that's our responsibility that comes with this privilege. Yeah, um, when you were out on the campaign trail, um, you know, did it kind of start occurring to you that a lot of people don't vote? Yes. And that <laughs> this is frustrating that, you know, I'm, you know, putting yourself out in many ways to, to engage, but yet a lot of people are not engaged. Did that strike you as kind of demoralizing, or was that just a new challenge for you, Carly, to say, you know what, I'm going to get people engaged. I'm going to, and not with, hey, what's our get out the vote thing? It's, this is, leadership is just growing other leaders and getting other citizens. Well, I, I do think that, and I would say all the time. In fact, when I launched my candidacy, I said ours was intended to be a citizen government. Ours was intended to be a citizen government, and we were never intended to have professional politicians. In fact, George Washington reminded us, warned us, in his farewell address many, many years ago, hundreds of years ago, to beware of the rise of political parties, because he said political parties come to care about only one thing, winning. And that was actually the thing that was so stunning to me as a candidate, is how true that is. The political parties, both of them, care only about winning. And Washington said parties will come not to care about governing or values or problem solving, but winning. And unfortunately in this country, winning in politics means a lot of conflict and a lot of controversy because that raises money, 
but it doesn't necessarily solve problems. And I think it's why citizens are so frustrated with politics. Mm -hmm. And do you think it also has a kind of, um, it plays out in when we get action, we're not getting durable solutions. I think that, absolutely. That, that it's kind of like, okay, we're going to do healthcare, we're going to do tax reform, we're going to do infrastructure. It's kind of like, all right, I kind of wanted this, you kind of wanted that. Okay, we'll kind of meet somewhere in the middle. And that gives us a sense of repose to act, to then implement and live as opposed to in two years, you know what? I'm getting right back at you. Well, you know, because the there's thing, not a durability to the, there's not equilibrium. I think that's right. To and I, winning I, versus losing, yeah. I'm winning the next one. Yeah, and I also think that what happens is in these big pieces of legislation, healthcare, tax reform, whatever it is, they're so vast, they're so complicated, there's so much in them that the truth is. Even the people who voted for him don't really know what's in him. And the complexity of Washington benefits always big, big companies with accountants and lobbyists. It influences, it, it uh, advantages big power. It advantages people of privilege and position. And so small people, small companies, small interests get kind of lost and washed away. The other thing that I think goes on. Um, technology in one way has helped the citizens be more active, but in a way it's also harmed us, I think. Because we have gotten in our heads that a hashtag movement is action. Yeah. And it's not. It's just a bunch of talk. Right. It's just a bunch of talk. I remember so clearly when Boko Haram kidnapped those 300 girls in Nigeria. And this hashtag movement started, Save Our Girls. And everybody felt so proud of themselves that they were joining the Save Our Girls movement. It did nothing. It made no difference at all. And so I do think sometimes technology can get people engaged and involved, and that's great. But I also think it can delude us into thinking that a protest on the street or a protest online is action and resolution, and it's not. Now, you recently wrote an article in the Stanford Social Innovation Review outline, entitled Redefining Leadership. Um, how do you think business leaders and political leaders define leadership, and how would you challenge and inspire all of us to redefine it in a way that leads us forward on a better path? Well, let me begin by saying that as I said a couple minutes ago, leadership's not about position or title, although most people think it is. And so I think there are a whole lot of quote unquote leaders who have achieved position and title, and therefore they think I am leading. I, I started out as a secretary, and I can tell you as a young woman typing and filing, I thought the guy in the big office was the leader because he had a big office. I think it's what most people think. And if you had great parking space and a lot of so perks, you, you had to be a leader. Yeah, yeah, you're a leader. Yeah. You're a leader. And then you get a little older and wiser, and you watch people, and you say, no, 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 they're not leading. What is leading? Leading is serving. Leading is problem solving. Leading is unlocking potential in other people and unlocking potential in circumstances in particular. Leaders see possibilities all around them. They collaborate effectively with others, which means they have to be both humble and empathetic. They have courage. They actually do have character. They understand the difference between a passing fad and something of lasting value. Those are kind of old-fashioned words, but boy, I think we need more of them. Um, I was also fascinated in the uh, article you said, you can't lead unless you understand how to work with people who are different from you. Um, and particularly when you say, you know, the leaders, people identify as parking space, big office, compensation. But you've said everyone really is a leader, and now you need to understand people different from you. Um, it's kind of what we're a great academic institution, but you know I'm kind of a little maybe old-fashioned. We always talk about educating the whole student. 
Yes, because and to develop that's what it all takes of to those become qualities. a leader. Everyone can be a leader. Not everyone chooses to be a leader. Leadership, most fundamentally, is a choice, I believe, mm-hmm. because to solve problems means you have to challenge the status quo, and that's not easier. Sometimes it's a lot easier just to go along mm-hmm. and get along. <laughs> and so a lot of people choose to lay back rather than to challenge the status quo. But I would say that... Um, The reason it's so important to be able to work with people different than you is because, and again, it's easier not to. It's easier just to work with people who are like you. and They understand you and you finish each other's sentences and we're all alike and we think alike and we all agree all the time. But the problem with that is you're missing something really important. And so if your purpose is actually to solve a problem, if your purpose is actually to make a positive difference, then you have to make sure you're getting everything you need to know. And you won't get everything you need to know unless you seek it out from people who think differently than you do or have different experiences than you have. That's why I tell, uh, in particular, businesses all the time, look, diversity isn't a nice to do anymore. If you want to really be successful, you better have a diverse workforce. Because number one, you're not tapping all the talent if you don't. But number two, you're going to miss something really big and really important, unless you have a very diverse set of opinions and perspectives and points of view. Yeah, it's interesting because when I um, talk about diversity on our campus, and um, I say you have to understand it's it's just a cognate to knowledge and discovery, which is I think this, you think that, we're different, we have different perspectives, different ideas, and that's how you move a project forward and so and it's how uh, you learn actually yeah, i mean it's fundamental to the learning process people don't learn i'll just talk about myself but i think it's human nature i am learning the most when i'm being challenged mm-hmm. if you're sitting around having a conversation and everything you say people go yeah yeah You're not learning anything, and you're not changing anything. You're just getting a lot of adulation, which a lot of people like with those big titles and big offices, but they're not moving the ball. Yeah. I always describe my job as it's working in a graveyard, a lot of people underneath, and nobody listening. And I always use that because I just think I realize that. It's like, well, I think something, and I want something, and I'm going to do something, and it's like... When you actually start to say, I want this, and you do it, you are going to fail because the credibility for institutions and leaders is really people buying in and saying, yeah, and, and actually me hopefully listening enough to say, oh, yeah, we should, yeah, we should have more flex time in the summer because our jobs are so seasonally intense. I've learned that from people. Well, you know, people and, used to say to me when I first um, got engaged in philanthropy or politics, I said, oh, well, it's so easy being a CEO. You can just tell people what to do. And I said, you know, um, when you're a parent, there are times when you say to your child, do it because I said so. Yeah. But every time you do that, you know you failed. Oh, yeah. Because your kids learn nothing, yeah. and he's probably resentful, yeah. or she. Yeah. And it's the same thing when a when a person in a position has the power to say, do it because I said so, it's not that that power isn't real. It's just that it won't solve the problem because right. people will just follow orders. Right. And sometimes that's required. Sometimes yeah. you have to follow orders and do what's required in battle, for example. Right. But if you're truly trying to innovate or solve a problem, or make the world a better place, make your community a better place, make your university a better place. That kind of problem solving and an unlocking of circumstances and the potential within those circumstances, that takes collaboration, right. not do it because I say so. Right, right. Are there any particular leaders that you know, you've studied or you've kind of mentors along the way or people that you've said, well, that's a really great leader or read a book 
that's really you know, moved you? Or? Yes, I've so many, and some of them, you know, no one's ever heard of. They're just remarkable people who are leading in their own circumstances. But um, because you asked the question, I I was struck the other day. I watched the movie The Darkest Hour, which is a fantastic movie about yeah. Winston Churchill. We did, too. We just watched it on Sunday. Incredi- you know, he's an yeah. incredibly flawed man, but he was a leader for the times. But why do I bring that up? I bring that up because at the very end of that movie, after the credits roll, there's this short quotation from him, which I think if every young person could really internalize, it would be fantastic. And he said, success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It is the courage to carry on that counts. And there's so much in that, that success, don't get too used to it. (laughs) Because it's not final, or as the Romans said, sick transit gloria, all glory is fleeting. Failure is never final. Uh, Failure is never fatal. And if you're going to try new things, you're going to make a mistake. If you think you failed every time you make a mistake, you're never going to try anything. To live life to the fullest to contribute to your full potential. It takes courage. There's no getting away from that. So having the courage to carry on really matters. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, for uh, my family, my, my sons, and certainly for our students and everyone on the campus, I would say if I could be like the Wizard of Oz and at commencement give you two things, it would be self-esteem and resiliency. And... Don't be so hard on yourself and think of would you say the things about yourself about a friend of yours. And so those are, I, I think, yeah. you know, the, the thing that I was, I focused on uh, in the Churchill was this, you know, incredible speech and this great leadership. And then the quote was really profound. And then, of course, he gets voted out of office at the end of the war. And that one really hit me too, which is, you know, don't realize that if you have the privilege of leading in some way, you you know, your indispensability is only if you grew other people to lead after you. Yes. And and he was gone. And leaders have seasons. Yeah. Every leader has a season. It doesn't mean they can't lead again in some other place for in some other time, but he was a leader for that season. The other thing that I, not to go on and on about that movie, but the thing that I think people sometimes don't appreciate about real leadership as opposed to position and title, yes, he gave great speeches, and those speeches mattered because he had to rally the nation, but on the other hand, the nation rallied him a few times. The the most remarkable examples of leadership, I think, is when he was all alone and everyone around him was telling him to cave and he decided not to. Yeah. Yeah, I I think that those kind of lonely moments of, you know, staring into the abyss (laughs) are sometimes uh, too often ignored when a leader has to transform something or lead someone out of a out of a, a, well, a it, it's, very challenging yes, situation. Yes, it's the other danger of our age. I think we yeah. were chatting about this a little beforehand. Technology puts a premium on instant response. Yeah. It puts a premium on instant likes. How many likes did I get? But the truth is that the real qualities of leadership, courage, character, humility, empathy, collaboration, seeing possibilities. Those are things that, yes, depend on effective interactions with other people, but they also depend upon a strong core and character. And that takes reflection and introspection and not just action all the time. Activity is not accomplishment. It's just activity sometimes. (laughs) Um, when we were talking the other day, and um, you mentioned this before, uh, you've referred to Tocqueville, mm-hmm. which um, greatly warms my heart um, because I think his insights on our country are 
really quite profound and timeless. And, um, you know, he did say that one of our strengths is this sense of civic participation. Um, how do you think we can reestablish not just civic participation, but a sense of civic virtue that I'm going to govern for some larger purpose? Is it, is, are we just in a bad patch, Carly? This too will pass? Or are there really a set of prescriptions that we should take into account as a society? Well, one of the things that de Tocqueville talked about was not just civic participation, civic virtue, but the importance of civil society. Civil society meaning non-government. <laughs> so that could mean the family, the university, the nonprofit, the church, the synagogue, all of these organizations that are not political or governmental. And so I do think that we have, we should never forget the importance of all of those institutions in the quality of life here. The second thing I would say is sometimes I think people become overwhelmed by the magnitude of a problem, and so they conclude that there's nothing they can do. I remember having a conversation with a someone who has a large um, youth audience, and he kept talking about nuclear war. And I said, you know, nuclear war is a real thing. It's a very frightening thing. It's a very serious thing. But honestly... Most of us can't do a lot about nuclear war, but what we can do a lot about is the environment in our own school or the environment in our own family or a problem that is sitting right in front of us in our own community. And so I do think, people used to ask me by way of analogy, when I was the chief executive of Hewlett Packard, we grew it to an $80 billion company. People would say to me, how do you get your arms around $80 billion? And my answer was $1 at a time. time. And what I meant by that was, yeah, it's a big number, but you know what? It's one product, it's one customer, it's one interaction at a time. And that is true for each of us as well. And so sometimes I think we get so overwhelmed by the controversy, the conflict, the magnitude of the problems. And sometimes you just have to, where can I make a difference right in front of me? Where can I make a difference in my dormitory? Where can I make a difference in my classroom? Where can I make a difference, perhaps encouraging someone who needs encouragement right in front of me? Where can I make a difference with my next door neighbor? I think we have to start there because all those little things do add up actually. And that may sound Pollyannish, but it's true. I think um, I think the point you made about civil society and institutions is one that concerns me a great deal. And um, as someone who's worked at a university for a long time, um, and a private university too, um, I think one thing that I find very troubling is the notion of let's kind of just disintermediate and what will exist is a public sphere with individuals. And I do think that there's got to be a little bit more focus on it's not just the government and the individual, it is these intermediary institutions of universities yes. and PTAs and um, uh, synagogues and uh, uh, temples and churches and libraries. And I, and, I, and I think it's kind of the government is the show, and yet we're all watching that show, but we're well, not politics real. is the show. Yeah, politics but... is the show. <laughs> Government, yeah. <laughs> Politics is worldwide yeah. wrestling, but it's become but that. To, but it's kind of like, well, how do you nourish institutions and then leave them alone? I mean, well, you, know, I, you know, kind of because we are the bulwarks. 
Well, I for think liberty, it, I believe. Yes. And by the way, I keep talking about problem solving. Leaders focus on solving problems. To do so, they have to challenge the status quo. So let's just talk about problem solving for a moment. I've learned this over and over and over again, and so have you. And so has everyone who thinks about it. The people closest to the problem know best how to solve it. Now, they may not have the opportunity always, they may not have the resources, but they actually know what needs to be done. So the second we start thinking, somebody far away knows better than we do how to solve a problem, we're lost. And unfortunately, you're right, we are thinking that more and more. The other thing that I would say, so if there's a problem you have an insight about how to solve it if you're right. impacted by that problem. Right. You have an incentive. You have ideas. That's right. The second thing I would say, and this has been true in our country, it's one of the other remarkable things about how our country was founded, but I've learned it over and over again as well. Power concentrated is power abused. You concentrate too much power in too few hands for too long, the power will be abused. It doesn't matter how well intended it is. And so when we create, this is a nonpartisan statement because both Republicans and Democrats have done it. When we create these vast bureaucracies in Washington, D.C., or vast political institutions with enormous power, that power is being abused. Oh, wow. Period. End of statement. And all that power and money, unfortunately, isn't the most effective way to solve the problem because most of those people don't really understand what the problem no, is. I, in my own little corner, and I'm sure you've seen this much more in your uh, very distinguished career, um, particularly in leading Hewlett Packard, but my senator, Lamar Alexander, said, um, I was complaining about regulation, and I said, you know, if I'm raising tuition, I mean, 3% of year, I said, what do you think my regulatory costs are growing every year? Of course. And, I mean, and put aside health care costs, that's a separate discussion. We can have that later. And so, I mean, he's, he said, well, you know, why don't you do a study on the cost of regulation? And no study had ever really been done. And this was not even including our $3 billion health care business. 11 cents of every dollar went to regulation. I'm not at and all surprised. And the cost of the regulation was equal to my net tuition. I'm not I at mean, all surprised. I mean, I basically surprised. took my tuition revenue and said, okay, I've collected $160, $150 million in tuition. Give it to the regulation. Yeah. And it's, and then people wonder why the cost of college is going and, up. And it's like, and I still, I mean, I don't know, I still haven't made an impact. And it's kind of like, you don't understand. It's like, and I mean, you know, then people would say to me, well, your tuition's going up. I said, I'll tell you what, I'll hold it flat if you hold the regulation flat. And I was like, well, you don't understand. It's like, well, I don't understand. You don't understand. We can't stop. It's like, why? I mean, isn't there? So I, but I see bureaucracy. But they're so distant. I mean, they're, I've got rules from Washington that regulate the candles in my dormitory. And I mean, I just raised that as one of my favorites, and I'm kind of like, okay, I have a fire department. I mean, the local people maybe would know, all right, how should you have fire safety on the campus? We're a big campus. I want to be safe. But the notion that there's somebody in Washington, and then you get legislation, and again, both sides, regulations, and it's like you get, we're collateral damage. I mean, it's just, you know, it's like, oh, well, that was nice. Um, See, I remember this is they raised the, fa do. the Fair Labor Standards rules were changed. It was like, okay, well, that could be $40 million. And someone's complaining about the cost of health care and education. It's like, well, that was just $45, $40 million. It's like, where am I going to come up with it? Let me ask you this as a, I mean, you were always under the gun as a CEO in a dynamic, changing business with shareholders and directors, and you know, and you're a public figure. Did you go into? Do you look at government and say, you don't know what problem solving and accountability is? I mean, I had like, you know, well, it's like you got three quarters, <laughs> fix it, folks. And I, I, I've gotten to the point where, I mean, even you know, I'll see six, eight members saying, well, we just came to this grand agreement. We're going to extend things for eight weeks. And, you know, congratulations to my colleague from, and I'm like, 
If I said I've got an eight-week solution to an existential threat, I'd be asked to come back in eight weeks and come up with maybe another longer term. How did you come to grips with that and keep your good cheer in well, all your campaigning? I, so first of all, I think that there are a couple... Th look, politics and government are different from business, yes. Yeah. But there are a couple fundamentals that come from business or running a large institution that people in government would be wise to remember. The first is that bureaucracies are self-perpetuating yeah. organisms. Bureaucracies just want to keep going. Book right on my show. And so if you create a bureaucracy and you give it money and authority and you never examine that money and authority, they're just going to keep churning out stuff. So you know, when was the last time budgets were ever cut in Washington, D.C.? I mean, it's honestly, it's been 60 years, really. People say, oh, no, no, we've cut budgets. No, they've just cut the rate of increase of a budget. So you have bureaucracies that are just mushrooming out of control and have been for a very long time. The second thing that I think, honestly, politicians forget is in business, in a nonprofit, in a university, actually results matter. Results matter, not talk, not votes, not winning, results. Is the problem better? Am I producing more? Am I meeting goals? And so I think what we have now is um, political parties that are consumed with winning. Winning means you get voted back into office. Mm -hmm. There's very little production of results. There is a perpetuation of the status quo by both parties, honestly, right. despite campaigning to the contrary. Mm -hmm. and, and the status quo means the bureaucracies go on mm -hmm. and on. And so uh, anyone who can start to throttle a bureaucracy, I'm all for, mm -hmm. Um, but I think to, for citizens to sit back and say, if I just elect the right person president, it's all going to get fixed, it's not true. Right, right. It takes a lot more than that. Right. One thing we do need, though, is fewer professional politicians and more citizens in office. That right. I know. Yeah. I, uh, I mean, I, I've been th through looking at term limits and wondering how they'd work and, uh, you know, I'm I'm not an expert in the area, but um, I do think that you know some way we have to find people who want to come together and solve real problems. Yeah. And I think and, term limits would help. I think yeah. many things would help. Yeah, and I also I also say, you know, we're in a time where everyone is like you said, do I win or do I lose? And I gotta just maximize everything for myself. Yeah. And for my... That's not leadership. Yeah, that's not leadership. Leaders I, don't worry about winning or losing. Yeah. Leaders worry about, am I solving the problem? Am right. I making progress? Am I improving the circumstances? That's what yeah. leaders worry yeah. about. Would you... Um, I'm just curious, would you ever run for office again? Or do you find serving maybe in an appointed office, Carly, a way that you could make a difference? Um, we're, we're, we're well, first of all, never say never. I, yeah. I have no regrets about my run. I, we made it a lot further than people thought. Um, I feel as though uh, I am making a contribution right now through my foundation and other things. Um, so, you know, we'll see what the future holds. I measure my life, honestly, not by predicting the future, but am I making a positive difference every day? Am I challenged? Do I think I'm helping to solve problems? Yeah. Do you enjoy your philanthropy? I do, very much. Yeah. Why don't you talk, much. just tell us what that brings to you kind of personally and professionally well, in bringing out the potential. We, we talked about well, civil society. Um, the truth is that one of the most important and one of the most under-celebrated and under-resourced parts of civil society 
are not-for-profits generally. And they're dealing, particularly community-based not-for-profits, who are dealing with enormous problems. Poverty, illiteracy, drug abuse. I mean, terrible problems in communities. And they're under-resourced. And so what we've done at Unlocking Potential, which is the name of my foundation, is to uh, literally build leadership development curriculum and work with community-based organizations so that leaders in those organizations that are dealing with tremendous problems can build their skills. The private sector business invests an enormous amount of money in leadership development, and a lot of it's very good. Um, the not-for-profit community doesn't have a lot of investment in leadership development, and yet there are so many leaders in civil society who have their hearts in the right places, they're focused on problem solving, they're not hung up on the position and title, and yet they need support and development and resources. And so I think and hope we're making a difference in that regard. Well, I think that's making a huge difference because what I see is so many well-intentioned, passionate people who really want to get local and solve a problem, and the next thing you know, it's like, okay, well how do I lead? Yeah. And, you know, you can, a lot of businesses fail. A lot of not-for-profits fail. And Absolutely. it doesn't fail for lack of a demand for the product, a need for change, but the kind of our own inability to realize that this is like starting a small business and scaling it up and working with people as a leader. You know, it's interesting. Um, human potential is the only limitless resource we have. And I am convinced through decades of experience that everyone has the potential to lead. So it is, in a very real way, an inexhaustible resource. And yet it is also true that leadership requires certain characteristics and disciplines. Those are the things we teach. And there are also a couple tools that leaders need to make real progress. I bring that up because so many times organizations will say, my biggest problem is I don't have enough money. And the truth is, usually, yes, everyone can use more money. But the right leadership capacity will help every dollar go further. And the truth is, if you can unlock the potential of the people in any organization, every problem will get better. It's just we don't, I think, spend enough time and enough energy focusing on the potential that each of us has within us to be a leader and solve problems. It's always been my passion and continues to be my passion. And I ran for office, frankly, because I think ultimately, all the way back to your original question, Ultimately, citizens have to understand their potential for leading where they are. Yeah. I think that's, that's very well said. I, I think, uh, you know, we're a big not-for-profit. But again, getting to your emphasis on civil institutions and solving problems, I think one of the good things about our country is we actually try through, through tax policy and other things create a private sphere of not-for-profits rather than saying, well, the government's going to kind of run everything. And I, I, there just was a new tax on universities. And, um, you know, one thing that concerns me in our society is to fail to appreciate the role that not-for-profits play and that the generosity of an individual to devote time and treasure is what builds <laughs> civil society. As, as you're probably doing as much now, maybe even enjoying it more than if you were at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Well, you know, it's funny. When people, I, I understand the instinct, particularly sometimes of young people, of college kids, to say, government should fix this. Government should fix this. And I think when people say that, they're forgetting some fundamentals. One fundamental is people closest to the problem know best how to solve it. Another fundamental is 
government is a big bureaucracy, and bureaucracies are terrible at solving problems because they're process-bound, and they're hierarchical, and they're slow-moving, and they're risk-averse. Sometimes I say to young people, you know, take out your iPhone. What's that world like for you? The world inside that iPhone, you are totally in charge. You can do anything you want. You can communicate with anyone you want. You can get anything you want. You can customize it. And by the way, just when you thought it could not get any cooler, any better, it gets cooler (laughs) and better and cheaper. And that is brought to you by the most innovative, the least regulated, the most competitive industry in the world, American companies lead. Now, compare that to your last visit to the Department of Motor Vehicles. What was that like? The Department of Motor Vehicles is a government bureaucracy. And what that experience was like was terrible. You weren't valued. There was nothing custom about it. Why? Because bureaucracies all operate a certain way. I don't care if it's a bureaucracy at Hewlett Packard or the DMV or Washington, D.C. They're not problem-solving organizations. Well, I also think monopolies that are bureaucratic... Which they are, are even by nature. Worse, by nature. <laughs> by and, nature. But I, I think it's... And government well, is a monopoly. Citizens right, don't have a choice. That's why I think we have to be very careful about, okay, this is what's a private sphere, and then this is what's the public sphere, and this is going to thrive because of ingenuity, innovation, compassion, empathy, virtue, honor, and to say, okay, and then we'll respect that, and this is what this fear does. And, um, you know, I've lived through a lot to see. It's almost like it doesn't matter who's there. It's always the same. I'm going to be in your business no <laughs> yeah. matter what. It's always I don't have the to same. Tell you that. Because and it's kind of like, I, you know, can't we respect some autonomy of strategy and thought and mission in our society? And it's one thing, it's just really, really is concerning to me. Again, not as a partisan matter, but as a drift in society. Yes. And it should be concerning to all of us. You know, it's a it's an extreme example, but I think it's an example worth thinking about. It's worth thinking about what's going on in Venezuela. Not to compare the United States of America to Venezuela, but Venezuela is a country where people said over time, we are going to ask the government to solve every problem. And over time, what happened is government took over everything. And what you have now, literally, is a country that was once prosperous and beautiful, that had a um, vibrant art world, that had a uh, vibrant civil society. What you have today is a country where people literally are starving. Government is not able to solve problems, the magnitude and the complexity of problems at the speed that our 21st century demands because bureaucracies are incapable of it. That's not a partisan comment. It's a practical comment, which is why all the way back to the beginning of the founding of this country, the reason citizens were made sovereign is because power concentrated is power abused. And our founders, not because they were perfect, not at all, but because they were experienced and they understood you give somebody too much power for too long, the power will be abused. Yeah. Well, you know, I I think it applies to universities too and our bureaucracies and, you know, how we have to reconceptualize ourselves. Yes. Companies give CEOs too much power after a while and then bad things happen. Right. Maybe we have some technology platforms that have too much power now as we're all starting to think about. Well, Carly, thank you for visiting our campus today to engage in this robust, informative, timely discussion that, frankly, greatly affects the direction and overall health of our nation and our democracy. Um, It's an honor to have you here at Vanderbilt, and you can download this and other episodes of the Zeppos Report at vu.edu slash zeppos dash report. Carly, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you.